forward and we're going to start section 1.1. So linear algebra is a major field of applied mathematics. It has its roots in linear equations, the sort that you first see in like high school algebra, but obviously it has moved very far past that kind of very elementary material. So we'll start with some basic definitions. And I guess the most basic definition of all would be that of a linear equation. So in high school or wherever you first see linear equations, it's y equals mx plus b, but you've also seen presumably at some point linear equations in the so-called standard form, where you've got your x's, and y is on the same side of the equation. <clears throat> and here we have two variables, x is a variable and y is a variable. And when you have equations written in standard form, there's no clear distinction between the variables. That is to say, when you have y equals mx plus b, x and y are clearly taking on different roles. x is an independent variable, y is a dependent variable. In the standard form, there's no obvious difference between X and Y. They're just variables together on one side of an equality. And the advantage of the standard form is here you have two variables. But this could be very easily generalized if you wanted to have more than the two variables. If you wanted to add a variable with Z, then there's a very natural way to do that. We just throw in a Z term like so. And in general, a linear equation will uh, move away from X, Y, and Z because we might want to have a bunch of variables. We might want to have 50 variables or something. And a linear equation will be a constant times our first variable, plus a constant times our second variable. And that pattern repeats for as many variables as we have. And then over on the right, we have some number. So that is a linear equation. And from linear equations, we actually, I probably need to give myself a little space here. From linear equations, we move straight into another elementary definition, which is 
a solution to a linear equation. So we've got however many variables we have got. Wish this were slightly less sensitive sometimes. We've got n variables. And a solution is a list of values, C1, C2, up to Cn. that satisfy the linear equation. So if you've got, for example, if you've got x1 plus 2x2 plus x3, equals zero, then zero comma zero comma zero is a solution. That is to say, if you let x1 be zero and you let x2 be zero, and you let x3 be zero, you end up with a true statement. Now, we're used maybe from like college algebra or calculus, we're used to a problem having a solution, but you see that this is far from the only solution to this linear equation. For example, one, zero, negative one is also a solution. One plus two times zero plus negative one is zero. And every linear equation, almost every linear equation, um, has infinitely many solutions. Like it's possible to have a very trivial linear equation like zero x equals five that just doesn't have solutions. But outside of those kind of goofy edge cases, there are going to be infinitely many solutions. And the set of all solutions is called clearly enough the solution set. That's a linear equation. If that was all we were doing in this class, it would be a pretty brief class. So let's take things up a level and define what we're really interested in. Which is a system. of linear equations. So we're going to be looking at multiple linear equations at once. And I'll nail down what I mean by at once in just a moment. But for now, our notation. Suppose we have 
two x one plus x two equals zero. And that's a linear equation. It has two variables, x1, x2. And now we have another linear equation. And there might be variables that don't appear in every linear equation. So maybe we have a linear equation 3x2 minus x3. And that x3 doesn't appear in the first equation. Equals something, equals one. To indicate that we want to look at these two linear equations at the same time, we enclose the bunch of them with large curly brackets, like so. So that's a system of linear equations. And sort of what do I mean when I say we're looking at these um, equations at once? Well, when we define cis solutions, sorry, and solution sets, A solution to a system is a solution to every equation in the system. So we're trying to solve multiple equations at once basically. I mean, linear algebra is much more than that. We're going to learn how to do this at the end of the first week and then move on to bigger and better things. But for now, let's state a goal. And our first goal in this class is going to be to solve systems of equations. And this goal, even though we're going to accomplish it pretty quickly, is not a trivial one. I mean, if you go back to this system, it maybe requires a little thought, like one negative to zero is a solution to the first equation, but it's not the solution to the second equation. So it's not a solution to the system. It's, it's very straightforward to find solutions to the individual equations, but solving them at once is not straightforward at all. And let's make some further observations. I said that outside of a few kind of silly trivial cases, every linear equation has infinitely many solutions. 
What about systems of linear equations? Does every system of linear equations have infinitely many solutions as well? And the answer to this question, I'll just say it outright, the answer to this question is no. And we're going to investigate this graphically in the plane. So let's first make the observation that if we have a linear equation that looks like this, its solution set graphically is a straight line. So a point is a solution to this equation if and only if it's on this straight line. And if we have a second um, linear equation, let's see, let's call these C1x plus C2y equals B2, then a point is a solution to this second linear equation. Again, if and only if it lies on some straight line. So to be a solution to both these linear equations, a point has to lie on two straight lines. And if you go to the Cartesian plane and you draw two straight lines kind of at Ran. Let's pretend these are straight. If you draw two straight lines kind of at random, what's most likely going to happen is that there will be one and only one solution that's on point, I should say, that's on both those lines. So, in general, what we expect from a system of linear equations might be that it will have one solution. But there are other cases. I mean, we could look, for example, at x1 minus x2, sorry, let's not use x1 and x2, let's use x and y, try that again. We could look at x minus y equals one. And then we could look at 2x minus 2y equals 3, for example. And what you'd get if you graph the solution sets to each of these equations is two lines running parallel to each other. And of course, there, if two lines are parallel, they never intersect. By definition, there are no points that are on both those lines. Ergo, 
there is no solution to this system of linear equations. And I mean, you could figure that out algebraically. If x minus y equals one, two x minus two y ought to be a two. It can't, uh, it can't be three. So it's possible to have two lines that intersect once or two lines that never intersect. The third case might seem kind of goofy. But going back to something I said just a moment ago, if you have x minus y equals two, and you have two x, sorry, x minus y equals one, and two x minus two y equals two, and you go to the Cartesian thing to graph these, and you graph x minus y equals one, and then you graph the second equation, and the second line just falls directly on top of the first line. These are the same equation. I mean, they're mathematically equivalent. They give the same line. So this system of linear equations has infinitely many solutions. So what have, and, and, that, and that's exhaustive. I mean, if you draw two lines, either they intersect or they don't. If they intersect, they either intersect everywhere or they intersect in one place. And that gives us the possibilities that there are no solutions, that there's one solution, and that there's infinitely many solutions. And what I've said, I mean, I'm looking at a very special case, right? I'm looking at two equations with two variables. But what I've just said turns out to be a true in general theorem. Any system of linear equations falls into one of three cases. There could be no <coughs> solutions There could be one solution. There could be infinite, infinite. There could be infinitely many. Solutions and 
a bit of terminology. If there's one solution or infinitely many solutions, we call the system consistent. And if there are no solutions, as you might expect, the system gets called inconsistent. The temptation is probably to think that only one of these cases really matters. The temptation is probably to think that we really care about that case and the other cases are outliers because like infinitely many solutions. Well, going back to that, these are the same equation right? You get from this equation to this equation by multiplying both sides by two. It's, it's pre-algebra that these are really the same. So you might think that in a very real sense, well, we don't really have a system here. We have one equation, and then we have the same equation written a little differently. Likewise, it's an obvious temptation to think that if a system doesn't have solutions, we don't care about it. I mean, if if there are no solutions to find, then what's there to do? Really, all of these cases show up in very concrete settings. I mean, going off the top of my head, you see infinitely many solutions in systems where our variables represent, where we're working with proportions. Like if, I don't know if any of you have ever done any chemistry, but balancing chemical equations. And there are an infinite number of ways to balance a chemical equation, depending on how many molecules are in the equation. So balancing a chemical equation comes down to solving a system of solutions with infinitely many solutions. Um, no solutions. This shows up in linear regression is probably the easiest way to look at this. Say that you've got a bunch of points, and you're looking for the line of best fit. Well, one way of looking at that is try we're trying to find a line that goes through all of these points. And obviously, there is no line that goes through all of these points. So what finding the line of best fit amounts to is looking at a system of linear equations saying, well, there's no solution to this. The solution would be a line that goes through all of these points. There is no such thing. And then trying to come as close to solving the system as possible. There are no solutions, but what's the closest we can come to a solution? So all three of these cases show up in very applied settings.
Let's go back to our stated goal of solving systems of linear equations. We now know that complications might arise. Maybe we're trying to solve a system and it turns out that it can't be solved. But we have a system <coughs> of linear equations. We're trying to solve it. What do we do? Well, in this section, section 1.1, we're going to kind of introduce the basic idea behind this. And then in section 1.2, we'll get to actually doing the work and solving the systems. But here's the basic idea. Some systems are very very easy. to solve. That's kind of observation one. So here's a system of linear equations. X1 equals three. X2 equals zero. X3 equals one. <clears throat> this is a perfectly legitimate system. Its solution can be just read right off. Three, zero, x1 is three, x2 is zero, x3 is one. Boom, system solved very easy. The second observation is that we can manipulate systems without changing their solution sets. So say we have a system 2x plus 3y equals 1, 2x plus 2y equals 2. Remember that a solution to this system is a solution to the individual equations in the system. So as <coughs> long as you don't do anything that changes those individual solutions, you're not changing the solution to the system. As an example, Let's leave this first equation completely alone. The second equation, we know from free college algebra, or maybe college. I think pre-college algebra, that if we multiply both sides of this equation by one half, it's not going to change the solution to the equation. 
function. So we could do that. We could multiply both sides of that second equation by one half. And because we haven't changed the solutions to the first equation, and we haven't changed the solutions to the second equation, we haven't changed the solution to the system. So this system and this system have the same solution set. And the observation that we can do this, together with this previous observation that some systems are very easy to solve, combine to give us our basic strategy for solving systems of linear equations. And our basic strategy is this. To rewrite the system without changing <coughs> its solution set. So we only want to do things like this that cha don't change the solution set. But we want to do things like this until the system is easy to solve. And that's the basic goal that we are going to pursue. Now, as part of this goal, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. First of all, we need to figure out what we can do to a system. Like back here, we took an equation in the system and we multiplied it by a constant. We multiplied it by one half and that didn't change the solution set. So what else can we do to a system to change it without changing the solution set? That's kind of the first question. The second question, what do I mean when I say that a system is easy to solve? I mean, can I turn that into a mathematical definition? Then the third question, okay, granting that I know what I'm allowed to do, and granting that I know what it means for a system to be simple, can I write down an algorithm of steps that I need to follow to take a system and make it simple? That's what we have to investigate, and we have quite some work ahead of us. But before we adjourn class today, let's investigate that first question. What can we do to a system without changing its solution set? And two of these are going to be very straightforward, and one of them is going to require a bit more work.
of the two straightforward ones, we've already seen <laughs> an example of one of these. We multiply both sides of this equality by one half, and that was okay. We can multiply an equation by a non zero. Constant. So in that example that I keep flipping back to, we multiplied the second equation by one half. Our next option is so kind of trivial that it might hardly seem that it's worth talking about, but two. We can swap the order the equations are written in. So if we have x plus y equals 2, x minus y equals one, and we feel for whatever reason that our life would be easier if that second equation was written first, and that first equation was written the second, we can certainly do that. It's not changing the solution set because it's not changing any of the equations. The third thing we can do is going to be more complicated and it's going to require a little more work. Let's go back to this. We can multiply equations by non-zero constants. And this is just algebra. I mean, if you have if you have an equation and you want to multiply both sides by a non-zero constant, you can do that. Well, the other major thing we'd do in algebra to solve equations would be addition or subtraction. If you have an equation an x a a. Um, there we go. We have an equation x plus 2 equals 3. We can subtract 2 from both sides to solve the equation. So we want to do something like that here. The problem is that adding or subtracting in the natural way will get us an equation that is no longer written in the form we want. 
because what all of these linear equations we're looking at, they all look the same. Only variables on the left, only numbers on the right. So if we took something like this, and we decide, okay, I want to add y to both sides. Well, adding y to both sides Now our variables are separated. We've got variables on the left. We've got variables on the right. We don't want anything like that to happen. Similarly, if we decided to subtract two, well, now we've got our variables and our constants grouped together on the left hand side, we don't want that. So here's what we do. Let's just look at this Suppose we have x plus y equals three. And suppose we have x minus y equals 2. Let's take this side of the equality and let's add the same thing to both sides. In particular, let's add 3 to both sides. Sorry, no, let's not do that. Let's add two to both sides. So we'll add two on the right. We need to add two on the left. Well, we know that two equals x minus y. So we'll add two on the right and the left, but on the right, we'll write two as two. And on the left, we'll write two as x minus y. So we've added two to both sides of this equality, but we have done it in such a way that our variables are still on the left and our constants are still on the right. We've avoided this kind of mess. And let's now turn that into a general rule. The third thing we can do when we're working with a system, we can multiply an equation by a constant and then add this to another <coughs> equation. Let's do an example of this to hopefully demystify this. Say we have 
And this, um, I mean, college algebra, two equations, two variables, this is basically the elimination method, if you remember that. So let's say we have x plus y equals 1, 2x minus y equals 3. We could multiply one of these equations by a constant and add it to the other equation. For example, and once we get to the actual algorithm in uh, Thursday's lecture, we'll see specifically where this comes from, but we could multiply that first equation by negative two negative 2x minus 2y equals negative 2. And we can add it to the second equation. Get negative 3y equals one. And now we have, to, we need to be careful here. We multiplied the first equation by a constant, but that was just a step on the road to changing the second equation. The first equation is still <coughs> x plus y equals 1. It's the second equation that we're changing with this step. We multiply the first equation by negative 2, added it to the second equation, and the second equation becomes negative 3y equals and these, that's it. We can solve any system of linear equations that has a solution by using these three steps and only these three steps. And we're running quickly out of time. Let me just put one more definition on the board. Two systems are equivalent if we and turn one of the systems into the other system using only the three steps that we just presented. Swapping equations, multiplying equations by constants, multiplying equations by constants, and adding them. And then I guess we can call this a theorem. Equivalent Systems have the same 
solution. So, given a system of linear equations that we want to solve, our goal is to find an equivalent solution that is somehow simpler, that is somehow easy to solve then we solve the simple equivalent system, and that gives us a solution to the more complicated original system. We'll pick right back up on Thursday. Glad to have all of you in my course. I will see you then.